okay, I know I can't be the only one that anyone else think that they may have potentially been robbed uh, by, just by the quality of the competition, that form in the final. Uh, if so, perhaps we may be entitled for compensation. I do hope so because that was really boof. Uh, let's get into it. I need all the wins. Yeah. yeah. Ain't no else. Gotta get a no call to quit. Yeah. Gotta keep on moving no matter how hard it gets. Back to Baker. Baker with the bid. Kurt Baker in for DC. And this may well do it all for Kurt Baker. With the try, the New Zealand Sevens legend, Kurt Baker, with the cherry on top. Can you believe it? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the On The Line Rugby Podcast, a show brought to you by the Believe Sports Network. I'm your host, Mike Naga Ishi, and welcome back. As I said in the cold open, you know, uh, it, it, it was just a bad day. I'm not going to lie. I may have turned it off at the 50th minute mark once Caleb Clark threw in his hat trick. I just didn't see it just across the board. I'm really disappointed in Clayton McMillan and the Chiefs game plan. Really disappointed in DMAC, especially disappointed in the performance of Cortez Latima, helping to lead the rest of the back line. And that four pack, like really, what were you thinking? This was not going to be a good time, no matter who was in that role. I, I, I just don't see anyone, even uh, say the prolific Bowden Barrett or a Franz Stein or a Andre Polar. Like, if that was the game plan that you guys were going for, like, it's a bad day to be a Chiefs fan. But, you know, uh, I just want to say congratulations to the Blues. You know, they had a lot of great concerted efforts. I think we'll go over some in this pod just because, you know, I, while I don't like you, I can't hate you for your great effort and great support line running. Uh, but that being said, let's just get into the top uh, takeaways I had for this game. It was mostly, in, in my honest opinion, I felt like they kind of phoned it in, you know, just looking at where the plays lied, how willing they were to take chances, especially against the Blues, which I do understand can be just a tad bit of a challenge, especially at Lionel time. Don't get me wrong. They are no slouch. But at the same time, you have to willingly be able to take that risk or else you're just going to be hurting yourselves in the long haul. Um, I th just think overall throughout the game, you're looking at very sloppy play, especially in terms of knockdown and breakdown and capability. You know, even if you took out the Ricky Rick Tellys of the world and uh, Josh Beers just kind of getting in there and really trying to slow down that ball, uh, even if without that, it, it was just bad. Like they weren't having the speed to expectations to get in. They were most of the time they were running alone or maybe with one other person and had to wait for a secondary support to really hold that breakdown down. And don't get me wrong, the Blues have a lot of breakdown specialists, so why would you not run in a pod? I don't understand that, but that's just me. Um, another thing was just passing accuracy and knock on. I understand you're trying to do a little much, but it goes to the point where, again, we go back to urgent, not frantic. And unfortunately, you were a little frantic. I think we all thought that, at least on the Chiefs end, that you were just going to come in and try to be clinical. Unfortunately, that obviously did not happen. And what ended up happening is you were trying to play hero ball to catch up with a very explosive blue side, and you couldn't put it together. I know you guys are thriving on broken play. You and the Blues both thrive on broken play. I don't know how you guys couldn't string at least something together, but uh. um, I think another thing that I really thought was really questionable was the overall questionability of the Christie play, uh, just in terms of whether or not he released it, because in my personal opinion, I really thought that the player had released the ball and was presenting it properly in the pike position, ready to be played out. And that friendly Christie had uh, lost his feet. But that's just me. You know, uh, maybe it's a little bit of a bias because I'm a fan, perhaps. But I, I definitely think it overarches a relatively, I wouldn't say above decent. Uh, I would say pretty good uh, called game by Nick Berry, who I, uh, for those of you who know me personally, I vehemently hate for the reasons above that basically the guy tends to mess up games that I think are really important for any other side not named a white uh, English or New Zealand side. If you really look at it, uh, especially in the Lions tour, especially against Fiji, just I, I do. And then he got accused of racism, which, you know, may or may not be unfounded. Perhaps he said a few things to uh, Bongi and Banabi. I don't know. I wasn't there. But it, the point is, to me, he is not uh, what I would consider an upstanding quality ref. 
and someone I would definitely want officiating my game. I mean, if you had to pull my hair onto who, who uh, you would want in a good game to which you know that would cause to be done relatively fairly or at least with great communication done in that regard, I would definitely say that Ben O'Keefe, uh, let's see, who else I can throw in there? Angus Gardner, who's my goat for the Southern Hemisphere refs. Um, that's really it. I mean, the rest of them kind of retired. I mean, I would say that uh, that ref that did the, I think it was the Fiji versus, uh, was it Fiji versus Ireland? I forget. It, it was one of the Fiji games where uh, yeah, Yako Paper was unfortunately ruled out. Oh, that's another guy I should probably throw in there. Yako Paper is a badass ref. Uh, but just in terms of where refs lie he was one of the better ones and there's been a couple good ones in super rugby who i unfortunately were not able to remember their names at the moment but don't think i forgot about you you guys have been doing a good job at least in terms of the officiating this year uh and nick berry i think really called a good game um i, I just think that, that the chiefs could not get out of their own way and that really caused a lot of the problems as i said to my girl when we were watching the game uh it, it was basically an equivalent of the fijian drew on a daily basis but in a professional drilled side, which is really depressing for me to say. Um, as many of you guys know, I love the Jura. I love Fijian play. I think most people around the world do. They're really electric. They bring a lot of fans to the table. And on top of that, their moves and athleticism are bar none, probably some of the best, if not the best in the world. But when you're looking at how they play in terms of not only just discipline, but also just the drilled ability to really hold their emotions down when things go wrong it is, is not there. And you can definitely tell that that's a problem. And that's a lot of reasons why they can't get out of their own way for most games, especially when things don't go all their way. Um, I think one of the good things that the Chiefs did, though, was their sliding cover D, which uh, I will admit is a two-handed sword, um, a... You know, on one end, I thought it was really good at silencing outside of a couple good breaks by Caleb Clark uh, to really shut down the Blues' wings and backline. You know, they really weren't able to get a lot of inroads in that regard. Uh, if you're looking at the rest of their team's offense, a lot of it was done basically because the Chiefs couldn't get out of their own end zone, uh, which is what we call, at least with my teams that I coach, the red zone, just because you want to get out of there just to get into the green zone, which is like the middle hashes of the field from – the opposite, say, 10 meter to the other 10 meter, just so you can get a little bit of breathing room to really call some open field plays, take a little bit more open field risks, and obviously get out of your own way so that they're out of range for field goals. When you put yourself in the red zone or that 10 meter behind or that 22 behind, it's not a good time for anyone just because any mistake you could do could lead the shots at the post or a five meter line out. And we all know, for all of us who have played, that's not a great time. And we will all die and suffer together. So if you're looking at it, it's great at one hand. Uh, I think that the one thing that I really did not like when it came to that sliding cover D was that they really just didn't respect the blues in the tight areas from the C man, which is like your third man in from the breakdown in. Uh, they were just spreading too far out and allowing that one on one matchup to really take place in terms of from that, say, D man in, which is the fourth man in or out from the breakdown on either side. And you could tell Blues are just taking it all day. It was just a ton, a ton of problems uh, just down there. Because by the time that they were able to really, you know, say maybe a Wallace, a TT, a Luke Jacobson was able to bring the guy down. You had uh, extremely quick ball by Friendly Christie, who while has terrible pass release, I will admit, is great when it comes to getting to the breakdown fast and really siphoning that ball out or then it gets to the right person is a whole nother issue, but just getting it out and keeping pace is huge. And when you have a team that's spread out, you're going to have to leave open gaps that generally will be exposed, especially when you're uh, quote unquote breakdown Lords, like a Satiti, like a Jacobson, like a Tupo Vai are out of the play. And you could tell they were specifically targeting them to really take them out of the defensive line call. Because without them, the defensive line was relatively, how should I say, inept. Uh, perhaps I'll lean towards a more indicative term, like just lost. Uh, yes, they could run the, the line speed, don't get me wrong. But when you're looking at a quality line, uh, it's called with a great pace. It's ran, it's adjusted well. They tell people who to roll over or not you know a lot of that comes down to those 
big guys in that team. And unfortunately, they kept getting taken out of the play game in and game out. And even if they say, for example, they did make the play, you also had the fact that really they were going to drive another two or three meters because they were just doing quick and dirty ball uh, when it comes to just pushing the Bruck forward, almost turning into a driving ball pseudo, if you look at it. It, it was a really great call by the Blues, and I, I obviously can't overstate that. You know, to have the kind of trust that Vern Cotter and the rest of the Blues backline had in their forwards really drive this game forward uh, is something really special. You know, a lot of people, they always say, yes, up the forwards. They're the reason why the backs get to do what they do and win the game. But I feel like a lot of people still underappreciate what forwards can do. And I feel like this game was won by the Blues forwards pretty much through and through. I mean, you wouldn't have gotten the inroads that you did without that forward pack, without that scrum, without Ofotunga Fossi just bullying that front row, uh, Dalton Papali'i, Hassan Satutu, and Patrick Tui Pelosi just really going in there and just wrecking house. And obviously, again, a brilliant thing that I love personally, the back's just playing forward. Come on now. We all can't lie when we see a – you know, Mark Talea, Caleb Clark, a Rico Yohane running a forward line off of a scrum or into a breakdown, just causing chaos, you know, really stretching the defense, causing people to really uh, overlook certain things out wide and leading to a try. I really can't knock it. It, it was brilliant. Uh, I think Vern's trust in a lot of the Blues team, especially this year, has really evolved them as a team. Um, while their culture in terms of just taking their foot off the gas is still obviously a little there. I feel like that'll take a couple years to get out. Fern is doing a great job. I would probably put him as coach of the year, uh, at least arguably in that line, just because, you know, you really just can't overlook the kinds of things they did this year. I mean, obviously, I think Clark Laylaw obviously needs to be up there as well. That guy's a freak. But we'll talk about them in a later segment. Uh, let's go back to what the Chiefs did wrong because there's a lot of things they did wrong. Um, in terms of what was the other thing, you know, if you're looking at whether or not how I said frantic, uh, a big thing with just be, for example, Cortez Vatimo is probably one of the better, in my personal opinion, young quick ball passers next to Noah Hotham uh, in the New Zealand side. And he just didn't look well, especially in the breakdown when he was able to get the ball out. Obviously, the ball was really slow. It was a lot of contestion um, at the breakdown. I think that kind of muddied his ability to really snipe and, I guess, kind of take over the game in his own way. Another thing was just the lack of, I would say, readiness by the Blues black line or even the forward pack um, off of open play to really just set up and get ready for the next phase. There was a lot of, I would say, indecisiveness, I guess would be a right word to, to put it, in terms of where they wanted to go as a team, whether it was, I want to uh, hit the boys out wide, Let, let's move these boys short, let's have them run an unders line and have these guys run an over line, let's hit the wide channels effective, uh, whether it was overthrowing balls, you know, not knowing where to go, and then just say, oh, I just take it straight, whatever. And things like that are going to hurt you in a game of margins where the Blues Basically, I'm not going to say they didn't have any errors, but they definitely limited it to a fine amount. And those kinds of things, as I've always said, will come back to haunt you. Um, also, another thing, what's with the lack of smiles by DMAC and obviously the knuckleballs? Uh, it, I, obviously, the biggest offender, I think, of this game would be Nana Seturo. That, <laughs> why would you ever think it's a great idea to have open space? You have two men on the outside, you have an open gap, and you decide to kick it. And then not only kick it, you boof it, and it only goes like five meters, and now it's still stuck in your own end zone. You really just did a great job at, at building my confidence as a viewer watching you play that you were really, you know, calm, cooled, and collected, and that you were ready to ball out and make a play. It's not how we do it. And as for DMAC, you know, obviously we all know his uh, propensity to take a very long time at the uh, T, and obviously to have his trademark smile that normally means he's probably gonna make a kick he wasn't smiling the entire game i don't know if anyone of you noticed i mean he kind of did but not really and then the rest of the time it was just knuckleball after knuckleball after knuckleball he wasn't getting good placement he was constantly getting contested uh i feel like he was just trying to rush through it to make sure that the blues did not block any of his kicks which i understand don't get me wrong but still i feel like you have to at least be willing to you know pull that kick back get ready, set your feet and do it again, especially after all the times you get boofing those kicks, 
it's it has to click somewhere that it's not going to work the way you expected and perhaps it didn't for him at the moment i'm just really disappointed as for the rest of it you know uh, i don't understand why there wasn't a second half adjustment i feel like the blues are just doing the same thing uh i really don't understand what was going on with uh clayton mcmillan to really kind of embrace having his team be a little bit more slow and methodical with the ball perhaps you know more of those anton leonard brown type basic plays those basic short and underlines really helped and obviously the setup their real only score of the game now if you take off of d max miss kicks and just the oh i can't forget this the overall just fear to contest the blues at lineout time now i understand that the blues still have probably at least in the comp one of, if not the best lineout groups uh, available, you know, even their lock group is deep. We all know what they can do. They provide a deep, deep, deep understanding of how to mess up an opponent's line and make your life in the breakdown of living hell. But if you're looking at it, you have to get out of your own way and you can't do that effectively without the use of a lineout, without the use of a quality clear out, and if you're only trying to go for short ball, I'm not sure if the knuckleballs were intentional. If you're looking at it as if the knuckleballs were intentional, let's just say at least half of them were. Um, you were trying to get the ball more to your own side and keep pressure on the defense, which is understandable. But also, if that was the case and it wasn't a mess up, uh, that's kind of dumb if you think about it just because of the fact that the Blues – are really great under the high ball. You have Mark Taleo, who's probably one of the best, if not the best, in under the high ball in the comp. Caleb Clark is another one. Uh, you have Harry Plummer, who's one of the best kickers in the comp. I wouldn't necessarily say he's one of the best tens, but at least one of the best kickers. And you could have done a lot better. Um, if you're looking at the entirety of the game, I think they may have gone for the line out once or twice. And majority of the time, they were spent in their own end zone because they couldn't get out of their own way at the breakdown. And then when they did, only went for scrums. And their scrums were not good. Uh, they were serviceable at best, at worst, god-awful. And you can't win a game like that. And then on top of that, to put it on top, when they were able to get the ball, the backs weren't really able to do anything. Uh, anyone? Any idea as to why this happened? Because I sure as heck don't. Um, I was just overall disappointed in this game. It, it was bad. I really thought that the Chiefs rested on their laurels. They didn't come with any good game plan at any second half adjustments. I, f I figured they were just going to, you know, if you're going to take the slogan of, uh, if you want to stop me from doing a play, stop me. Uh, I figured that you would at least do the right thing and try your best to win front football. And when you don't, I'm a little disappointed, I'm not going to lie. And I think it really showed. <sighs> Um, it's just a lot. You 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 got to get out of your own hair, and you, for a side that to fall from grace this far is kind of depressing. Uh, also, can I not just say how boneheaded I guess would be the sound uh, to put a World Cup over a provincial um, a provincial trophy over the World Cup by Rico Yawane? I don't understand why you would say that. I understand the Blues haven't won in so long. You run a lot of losing teams. But when you're with the All Blacks and you're facing the world and playing for your country, I feel like that would mean more, perhaps, than your provincial career. I don't know. Technically speaking, you've already won one, if you think about it, because you won the Trans-Tasman. But, you know, obviously some people will argue that that's a real title or not just because it was during COVID. But, eh, I, I, I think so. And technically now you're two-time winners since what 2004 ish when they last won the trophy i believe it was 2004 2003 so i guess props up to you guys but still what are you thinking uh to move on to more happier things let's just finish off with my team of the year personally this is built off of guys injury or not that were up there in their lineups really just doing the work and obviously wrecking house um, there are a couple people who are on here, but were knocked by injury early, but I feel like they belong here regardless because if they were here throughout the entirety of the season, I feel like this wouldn't have been really different. Uh, let's look at it for our front row. I have Xavier Numia, Osafa Omoa, and Sam Talakai for basically the same reasons. All of them played exceptional amounts of minutes. 
all of them did great work at the scrums and breakdowns and both had great running plays. And especially with Sam Palakai leadership of his team uh, through good and bad with Rob Liotta out. I think my best locks of the comp would have to be Patrick Tui Peloto and Lucan Salakai Aloto. Um, despite Salakai Aloto basically being injured for a majority of the year, three quarters, I believe, you know, I always said he probably would have been my player of the year this year. And it really showed um, just because he did everything right the rebel way. And it's sad that he couldn't finish off his final, or at least final season in Melbourne with his team. But that being said, let's move on uh, for my, Back row, I went with Brady Nyose, Dalton Papali, and Hassan's Tutu, basically for three reasons. Breakdown Lord, effective at moving the ball, and great support lines. Those guys all do everything exactly the way I wanted to, and they pass the eye test in every standard. As for the halves, I went with Cam Roygaard at 9. I don't even need to really tell you that why, and DMAC at 10. Again, if you take away the final... I don't have to have a reason to tell you why that guy's a freak. Uh, they all played and passed the eye test, and he continues to be as advertised in every sense of the word. Um, as for my centers, I went with Jordy Barrett. This is probably the most confused one I had. Uh, don't get me wrong. Jordy Barrett has been a great supportive player. I think l less involved with the kicks for better, for worse for the hurricanes. Uh, I really think he should have been more involved, but that's just me. And obviously just, you know, I wish he did a little bit more. Uh, obviously, the effectiveness of the Hurricanes and the explosiveness on all sides, but I think really limited his ability. But I think I want to have another year where he's more featured as a player in that back line. I, and then my 13 was Iosef Omasi, just because homeboy's a freak. I can't leave him out here, especially with all the things he does. Even when he shut down, he opens up so many holes for the Duro to really just take advantage and rip apart a team. He, he can't be overstated. Uh, as for my back three, I went with Mark Talea, uh, Severis, and Tom Wright. Now, one could argue I probably could have put Caleb Clark because of his last half of the year. He did really well. I think the first half was eh. Um, but I think Mark Talea overall throughout the year, maybe it was because of mileage. Maybe it was because of you know other things. But you could still see flashes of that line-breaking mentality, that uh, bully at the ball especially ownership of the high ball that I had to put him in here. Uh, I would have loved to put Caleb Clark in my bench. I thought that there were just too many people that I really had to uh, take him out and put him as an honorable mention. As for Tom Wright, he's done everything right for the Brumbies. They've been consistently up there every year with the comp. And on top of that, he's one of the best support runners probably in Australia and probably in the Southern Hemisphere, you could argue. Uh, I really love watching him play. As for my bench, I went with a 5-3 split, uh, bomb squad specifically. So let's go through it. Uh, for my front three, I got Masake Doge. I got Ricky Riccatelli and uh, Michael Ala Alatoa, just because all three of them were, despite being older players, really took ownership and taking a, I want to say, renaissance year. You know, you can almost consider it like a Peyton Manning with the Broncos timeline for all my NFL fans or... Uh, no, let's see another one. You go maybe Steve Nash on the Lakers. Uh, that type of deal, I guess. An older player kind of revitalizing his career with a new team. I really thought that outside of Doge, who has obviously been a staple of the draw, Ricky Riccatelli coming into the Blues, a lot of them thought he was washed up after being cut by the Hurricanes, you know, losing his spot to Eklund and the rest of those boys and then finally taking ownership and becoming the player that I missed watching him play in 2018. Just seeing that kind of agility, that breakdown ownership, that effective throw at the lineup, that powerful run and powerful support carry. He does everything right. Same thing with Ala Alatoa. Despite being injured, you know, he honestly is probably one of the biggest stalwarts in Australia when it comes to front rowers, and he does a great job of making sure his team's in the best position to succeed, not only in ownership, but also through scrums. Uh, through great line on call and especially through just really short ball running. He's probably still one of the best despite being his age. Uh, I went with Nick Hannigan and Peter Lockeye for my last two, my one lock and, well, I guess utility forwards. Uh, if you're looking at Hannigan for the War of the Taz, him and Jed Holloway were absolute freaks. Uh, I really think that the if he took out a lot of the problems that the War of the Taz had this year, which we'll discuss in a later episode, that – 
you know, he was one of the brighter stars and having him leave will really hurt that team moving forward. And he, you're going to tell him from the Wallabies, if he is selected, uh, I have not reviewed the lineup. I know the all blacks were selected. I've heard rumors that it may have come out, uh, but I will get back to you on that for international elections on a later show, but he's a, a people mover at all since the word. And he needs to be in there just because he has dual capability, not only as a lock, but also as a loose forward, uh, Peter Lockheye, what reason have I not said over the last, what, 20 rounds that he needs to be in here? He deserves some love. Uh, as for, speaking of love, actually, let's go for our backs. Uh, I went with Anton Leonard Brown, Ruben Love, and Jacob Ratavmuki Nipkins, just because all three of them do th three things great. They put themselves and their teams in the best position to manage the game and succeed uh, through kicks, passing, running with the ball, quick probes. Uh, all of them, minus... GRK really kept a lot of penalties to a minimum and all of them are electric in the right word. Now, Leonard Brown did kind of come a little late. Uh, Ruben Love did get silent a little bit due to injury and really GRK was kind of just a mixed bag after like the first two thirds of the season, but all three of them deserve the love that they're getting today. And for that, my flowers go off to you, my team of the year, 2024, a great, uh, I would say magical mystery tour in terms of the Beatles of this year. Yeah, you had a couple good hits, but then outside of that, it was just weird. Uh, a, a, a lot of things I really wish were better and changed for just from this year alone. A lot of things I will talk about in future episodes on why, for example, things went wrong, things didn't go wrong, where uh, things that the league comp can go. But until then, that's going to be it for me this week, guys. Thank you so much, and I'll see you next week. Peace.